Do you, during the trial, I know that there were other girlfriends or, or people that had testified. Yes. What was that like? Because it established a pattern. It, just, it established a pattern, particularly when the girl, woman, had uh, gone to Florida to get away from him. And he had sent a, a friend of his down there to essentially break into her apartment and mess up the clothes, you know, put her clothes in the uh, bathtub and urinate on them and that sort of thing. <laughs> that was, that just painted him, uh, painted a poor picture of, of uh, your dad. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in Richland County history. Dr. John Boyle is accused of killing his wife, Noreen, and burying her body in the basement of his new home in Erie, Pennsylvania. The 12-year-old son finally took the stand. As I heard a scream, I heard a thud. It was about this loud. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. When I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself, and it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers. Welcome back to another episode of Moving Past Murder. I'm your host, Collier Landry, and what's going on? Ah, another Friday in the books. Here we are. Welcome back to another episode. This is part two of my episode with Richland County Common Pleas Court Judge, the Honorable James Henson. He was the judge at my father's murder trial for murdering my mother. Um, He's retired. Sorry, he's still not active. But he was the longest serving Richland County Common Pleas Court Judge in history. Like 35 years, I think is what he said last episode. Anyways, this is part two of that episode where I discover more, <laughs> more interesting facts about my father and the trial that I didn't know because I was only there for two days because I was testifying. Wasn't allowed to watch it. Didn't really know what happens. So in this episode, we're going to discover a little bit more about a, an instance that happened in the courtroom when my father's girlfriend discovered some info that she didn't like. Now, this was his mistress that was at the time of my mother's murder, nine months pregnant with my half sister. And, um, you know, she got looped up into some nonsense by way of my father manipulating her, obviously. And, um, she had to go to the trial. She was a new mother. And, uh, so judge Henson is going to share a little bit of info about that in this episode, but I want to give a shout out to all of you who have come here via TikTok. I've been posting a lot of videos lately. You guys have seen of my trip back to Mansfield, where I got to go inside my old house, where I met up with Dave Messmore. We had a little chat uh, where I got to show you guys the courthouse, actually, which is where uh, all of this action took place with Judge Henson. And for those of you that are subscribing to me on Patreon, we have our guest meet and greet this month, September 20th, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, September 20th live meet and greet where you guys get to ask me your Q and A's. Check it out. I do one every single month. It's really, really cool. You guys get to ask me anything you want for an hour on Zoom. No holds barred. So it is a new and really exciting way. I share some pictures. I share some family stories. I got all kinds of cool stuff that I share there. If you guys want to check it out, it's patreon.com forward slash Collier Landry. Anyways, enough of that spiel. So this week's listener comment, I want to pull again from YouTube like I did last week. This one comes from Pirate Podcasts on YouTube. And it says, your dad was my grandmother's doctor for like 20 years. She swore by him. She absolutely loved him. I'm sorry for what happened and what you, Miss Noreen, and you guys and your family went through. You're a strong man. Be safe and God bless you. I couldn't even imagine. Well, you know, as we talked about with Judge Henson last week, you know, I was very curious about, there were so many people in the community that had a lot of disbelief that my father could do what he did. And we discussed it in the previous episode, how having a doctor of his caliber or rather perceived caliber, because he, I guess, manufactured a lot of his uh, accolades before coming to Mansfield with my mother. But <laughs> how that was a big deal coming to Richland County, coming to Mansfield as a doctor and contributing to the community. 
and joining the community, how excited everybody was. So the fact that a doctor could commit this horrific murder of his wife was really a big deal for people. So um, that's what really added to the media circus. So yeah, your grandmother was one of many of my father's patients. I think they said at the time of his arrest that he had seen something like 80,000 patients in total over the years that he was working in Mansfield, which was like six years or something. So um, it's really interesting and, uh, and also really sad because those people believed in him, right? But I'm really excited to have Judge Henson back for part two. We're going to discuss even more details. It's not as heavy as last week's episode, but it is. it does have some really good insight. We do learn some more insight into my father's shenanigans and things that went down in the courtroom that nobody ever knew about. And that's kind of really cool stuff. And again, it's really amazing that Judge Henson gave me his time in retirement, took time away from his doggy and his grandchildren and showed up for us and, and gave me a great interview. I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so happy that I, that I sold him those rollerblades almost 25 years ago at playing against sports because <laughs> I obviously made a really good impression. Actually, I made a really good impression by being a really good witness. Here is the second part of my interview with the honorable retired Judge James Henson. It's interesting when you look, at least for me, when I look back and even just hearing what you're telling me, how many things have to fall into place to get a conviction. All right. And that's the American justice system is right. yeah. it's innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's very unique to our justice system as flawed as it is. But all of these things, I mean, if you figure I don't testify and he doesn't testify, he probably walks. Not with what they had in this case. No, they had, they, they had him running a jackhammer. They had him running coal storage. They had all this. They had him telling he's going to put a basketball court down there. They had all that evidence when it was an impossibility. But if he had just not done anything, left her laying on the floor. Or if he had taken and dumped her body off the side of the road somewhere, they wouldn't have had that evidence. They just wouldn't have had that at all. Did you hear the story that what your little baby sister said to, to the woman who was taking care of her? No. She said she had been with, the, with Susan Barr for two or three weeks. She says, Daddy hit mommy in the head with a hammer and wrapped her up in a blanket. We couldn't let that in because it, you can let in race just something that's said without suggestion. But this was said, Susan said, we never talked about the case at all. But she, the little girl, said those words. But we couldn't let it in because the, the, it was too too suggestive. Yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, there were listen, people who listened to your testimony wondered, was he, this any of this suggested to him? And you you were so, so plain and uh, what I want to say, uh, plainly telling the truth from your standpoint that you weren't coached. Nobody, nobody told you what to say. No, they didn't, not <laughs> at all. You, if they had a view, they probably said, oh no, no, hey, wait a minute. I'm the man over here. <laughs> I, well, I, 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 because I was angry and I knew what happened and I knew that I wanted to get justice for my mother. And I knew that I was the linchpin because at the, you know, before the trial, obviously, it was treated as a missing persons case until Dave Messmore got involved. And it was until I said to, you know, I got Dave to my school because it was a safe place and I was able to tell him everything. He had no backstory of what was going on because I couldn't say anything in front of my grandmother. And when she went at the time to call my father because she was angry he was in our house, when I said, give me your business card, I will talk to you. And I got my principal, Lynn Riggenbach, to call him the next day and he came down to the school and I was able to tell him about Sherry, the, you know, the, uh, all of my father's behavior, his proclivity for violence, all of that. It, it started then because he said, right. mommy took a little vacation and I wasn't going to let him get away with that. But I remember Jim Mayer telling me, 
you don't have to do this. And I said, I think I said to him over my dead body, because my mother used to say, I used to use my mother's expressions. Yeah. So my mother would say, well, over my dead body. <laughs> and I said to him, over my dead body. Oh my gosh, yeah. Because, because it was the right thing to do, but I was also terrified because this man's a monster. He's been a monster my whole life. And now I have to face him down and knowing that if he goes free, I will probably be remanded back to his custody and he will torture me the rest of my life, if not put me in a ditch someday. Yes. Did, you know, Peg Hopkins, do you remember Peg Hopkins? I do. She was your mom and dad's neighbor. Well, she had been my neighbor before she moved into that neighborhood right down the street from me in Coleman Road. I got a call at home from Peg Hopkins. I pick up the phone and without saying another word, she says, Jack killed Noreen. I says, what are you talking about? She says, Jack killed Noreen. I says, Tell me what you're talking about, Peg. Tell me. She says, she's not over there at that house. She would never leave her children with that woman, her mother-in-law. She says, she would never do that. And she's not there. And the children are here. And her mother-in-law is there. I says, this is this is in the morning of the day that she got done. I says, okay, all right. Uh, call the police and tell them what you know. Something like that. She says, I'm calling you. I says, I'm the judge here. I can, you know, just I, I can't do anything with that information except tell somebody that you told me that's your saying they're not going to listen to it anyway. But I believe that your dad thought that nobody, nobody, not the neighbors, not anybody, would. He, he was such a wonderful guy that no one would ever believe he would do a thing like that. He couldn't believe it in himself. He didn't believe it. He just couldn't believe it happened. And everybody suspected him immediately. And he assumed that nobody would ever suspect it. Yeah, because oh I called. Yeah, sorry. You saw him in the courtroom. How much did he weigh when you saw him in the courtroom, if you remember? Probably 190 pounds. No, <laughs> he weighed a lot less than that. Really? When he when he was arrested in Pennsylvania and brought back to the courthouse, he weighed 202. Yeah. He weighed a, either 146 or 164 at trial. People said, wow. that little scrawny guy, there's no way he could pick that woman up. He had been muscling up. Did you work yeah. out with him? He was he was bustling up and he was really strong in ninth, early 90. 80, 89, yeah. He was bigger, much bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And he sat in, in jail for a long time. Of course you don't get you don't get you just don't get fat on jail food. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> and and he, he just he was saying to his attorney, Look at me. There's no way I can handle her. And he was saying, Somebody else, somebody else had to do it because I couldn't do it. And that's that's where people got the idea that either the chiropractor or or what his name uh, was, I don't remember what Mr. Davis was, and this young man, that they must have had to be involved, and maybe they were the ones guilty. Some concrete out of that basement was found in Mr. Davis's backyard. Yeah. Their dad insisted he take that there to throw the suspicion off of him. Some kind of friend. <laughs> but at that time, he was just grasping for straws because he had already done some really, really guilty looking things. And uh, and then all of a sudden he realized the police are going to find this out. We've got to do something about this. I've got to spread the blame or, or make, make it look like somebody else did this. Well, it didn't work.
I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it is. It's, that, that's, that's exactly right. And that's what the jury was saying. It was unbelievable till he testified and proved that it was completely believable. <laughs> completely believable. Yeah, like the gentleman said, I don't know if I could have found him guilty if he hadn't testified. Now, I know some of the other people could because they, they had heard it, but he, he won some direct evidence. He wanted him to admit his guilt before he's going to find him guilty. Well, he got on the stand and essentially admitted, he admitted he was guilty. But, 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 but he didn't, he didn't put her under the floor and he didn't jackhammer it up. But of course, the evidence was, in fact, he did. He did. And when people started suspecting him, he, he just looked like, I can't believe this. I cannot believe that these people, who am I thought was my friends, are, are believing that I could do something like this. The, uh, as they say, the cat was out of the bag. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember talking to me after you sentenced my father when I came to your chambers? I remember you being there, but I don't remember specifically, no. Because you talked to me about forgiveness and I remember you had your little Stevens oh. ministers pin on your robe or your jacket at the time. And you talked to me about forgiveness. And it was something Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, but I just remember you were saying something to the effect of you can't forgive if you can't forget. Mm -hmm. And you were saying how, how essentially you were explaining that you had explained to me what that you had found my dad guilty, that my dad was found guilty. You were, you had done the sentencing, but essentially in that very key pivotal moment in my life, you said to me, essentially, Collier, you need to find a way to not let this control you. I hope I said that because I try to say, I really hope I said that exactly because I know of cases, many cases where people have hung on and hung on and hung, become bitter, become Ang angrier and angrier and they don't they don't even start to get over it and they don't intend to ever get over it because because they have they don't want to <laughs> they're, they're angry they have a right to be angry and and the person he's in jail he's not he's not paying he ought to be dead oh come on that's 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 beyond that's for somebody else to decide not the Amish people and the Mennonite people that have come to my court, they will not, they will not. Oh, I guess I'm, I'm being a little bit obtuse. They will not not forgive. They immediately choose to forgive, not forget, but forgive, and then go on living their life. Not as if it didn't happen, but the person is forgiven. And if, if, if somebody else wants to judge them, that's fine, but not me. I've had several situations where those folks, Mennonites and, and Amish, people have been killed, run over by the buggy. They immediately, immediately with their bishop Go to the person that caused the tragedy and forgive them. Because they know that they're not, they may not be doing that person, any good, they're doing themselves good. They're not yes. going to allow it to destroy their life because somebody else's life's been damaged or destroyed. And it's a, it's a Christian, it's a Christian way to look at it. It's, it, it's not the only way to look at it, but it's, the only sane way to look at it. Well, I think for me as a 12 year old child, I think for me as a 12 year old child, what you were really trying to 
what you're trying to instill as me is that you can't forget. Mm -hmm. You're never going to forget that your dad killed your mom. <laughs> you're never <laughs> going to forget that. You never forget about testifying in this. You never forget about everything that led up to this, the investigation, all of these things. But you're going to have to find that way to move on with your life. And this program is called Moving Past Murder. And it's about my process of moving past something like this in my life. Mm -hmm. And to show people that you have to forgive. And I wouldn't have been able to do and to lead the life that I've led without doing that. I had to come to that conclusion. I appreciate that very much. You know, let me tell you a funny thing happened. Well, funny things do happen during trials. We're on lunch break. The courtroom is now filled back up and there was no room in the courtroom behind the bar. My daughter, who you've talked to, was 16 at the time and they had said that Sherry would be testifying after lunch. She wanted to be there for that. <laughs> so I had one of the deputies tell me the whole front, they kept the front row uh -oh, inside the bar open because it's a safety sake. I said, can you lay, arrange for her to sit right there in the front row there? So sure. So she's 16 years old, gorgeous girl, walks into the courtroom and sits down. Now, the jurors have heard, not the jurors, the audience has heard that Cherry Boyle's necessary. <laughs> Campbell is going to testify after lunch. As soon as she walks in, sits down, she said, there's Sherry, there's Sherry, there's Sherry. Now, I went in the girl. Peg Hopkins was. The whole room was a buzz, and you go, oh man, there she is. This work, this ogre that they've all heard about here. <laughs> Peg's got up from her where she was sitting, came up, court wasn't in session. She came up and hug Kristen and turn to the big audience and says, this is not Sherry Campbell, this is the judge's daughter. And they went, oh, I mean, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, I wasn't in the courtroom, I wish I had been. Well, if I'd been in the courtroom, it would have happened because they would, wouldn't able to do that. Sure, but, sure. But she's, Kristen heard him saying, Sherry, oh, what a Sherry! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh no! Peg said, "No, no, no, no." <laughs> so there was a little light moment in there, but when Sherry did come in the courtroom, it was the same thing. Of course, my daughter's the uh, 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 frame girl, you know, and Sherry's a little baby there, and the, the, <laughs> I see him looking at her, looking at my daughter. I mean, the jurors were just, not jurors, the uh, audience. The gallery. They were, they were flabbergasted, you know. The, the, this little woman here is the one who caused all this trouble. Yeah, right. <laughs> she didn't, of course, but uh, she was involved in it. Mm -mm -mm. Right up to my teeth. Yeah, she was just another victim. I mean, she was 27 years old, I think, at the time. I, uh, was she that old? I don't 26 think or 27 she was she was like 27 tops maybe 28 i you know i thought she was like 21 or 22 i don't know no she was no she was like she was like 27 or 28 at the time she but i mean still compared to my daughter who looked like she was 16 she looked younger yeah oh no she looked she was because she's very small frame she's a very mm -hmm. small woman and you know i think that she you know she had bought into the fairy tale that I'm going to marry a doctor. It's going to be this wonderful life, you know, and I, and a lot of people do try to cast blame on her or try to excoriate her for her behavior. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure we're, we're all not perfect people, but I look at her as just, even though I had anger with her because I'm like, how did you not know about my mom? I never thought she was involved in killing my mother. I thought that she might have known and turned a blind eye, but again, she was young, she was pregnant, she had just come out of a bad marriage, you know, um, 
she was looking for a new opportunity and and my father was it and then my oh. father sold her on a bill of goods a golden opportunity like how many girls in their mid-20s with a couple of children can snag a medical doctor's making hundreds of thousands of dollars and promises a wonderful future you can understand you can understand how she got caught up and uh 100%. It's, sad. it's really sad and it was really something when she called him a, a name in court and it was the first time i believe i have to say i don't know what everybody else believes that's the first time she realized she'd been duped do you during the trial i know that there were other girlfriends or or people that had testified yes what was that like because it established a pattern it just established a pattern particularly when the girl woman had uh, gone to florida to get away from him and he had sent a, a friend of his down there to essentially break into her apartment and mess up the clothes you know put her clothes in the uh, bathtub and urinate on them that sort of thing <laughs> that was it just painted him uh, painted a poor picture of of uh, your dad so uh, so it wasn't him that did that he hired somebody yes um, yes i don't know if he hired somebody but somebody else went down there and did it and then they, they testified to it but you know he did some really really strange things he had told the woman in florida hey i can do whatever i please so what he did he went to auto smith's studio put on a navy uniform raising his rank <laughs> one level got otto's girl a 19 year old girl to sit by him and take a beautiful picture and had that and sent it down to her and said see i can do whatever i please i'm marrying this girl she's the daughter of the head of surgery at ohio state university and, and you think i can't do what i tell you i'm going to do look at this we're getting married did you ever hear that story before I, I wasn't sure who it was or Otto Schmidt studio, but yes, somebody told me that story mm -hmm. uh, and I was just stunned. <laughs> stunned, right. Somebody told me that he put it, he actually took an ad, like an ad out in the Columbus Dispatch with it, saying, mm -hmm. announcing his engagement. The guy who went to Florida alleged that he was the one who had procured girlfriends for your dad, you know, that they were, friends and he he did whatever he was asked to do and and uh he says, that's that's just what i that's what i did or that's what i do you know <laughs> who was this guy i don't know his name right now but i know he's he was uh they said he must have been involved because it wasn't davis the chiropractor the the yeah it wasn't he it was another young man and uh he, he said, after the trial, he said to the prosecutor, why didn't you ask me more questions so I could tell you what was really going on? Of course, Jim Mayer, the prosecutor, didn't want to blow his case out of the water. So he, not knowing the answers to the questions, he smartly didn't ask the question. You would never want to ask a question of a witness when you don't know the answer. Oh. Because <laughs> an answer can... Uh, it could just cause a mistrial. It can cause the case just to fall absolutely apart. So you, that's the reason you talk to your witness ahead of time, or at least you investigate everything as well as you can so that you know the answers to the questions before you ask them. And uh, so he didn't ask some of the questions that, that could have been asked. It would have been uh, explanatory somewhat questions weren't asked and then of course after the trial is over he talks to the prosecutor about why didn't you ask me about this why didn't you ask me about that he sat on the stand and whistled it was a curious thing i'm sitting right beside him and he said uh, i mean literally looking around the room nor less begging the prosecutor ask me another question 
He was only on stand about 20 minutes. Huh. He should have been on stand all day, but he wasn't. Because they didn't know the answers. They didn't know what he knew, and they didn't know what he'd say if they asked the question. And they, that being that the case, they didn't know what to ask and didn't ask any questions about their interpersonal relationship. It was a strange, strange moment of trial. From a trial judge, at that time I had 12 years experience. I'd been up, it wasn't my first rodeo. I'm sitting there saying, this guy needs to be asked some questions. He literally, he actually said, all the time he was on the stand. And then asked the question, he said, what? And I, I, I really got close to calling him down, you know? Stop the silliness. But to him, it wasn't silliness. He was just saying, you know, like, like raising his eyes like, oh, gee, why not, why? he's not asking me the questions. And he didn't. Because they were trying to like not put themselves in a hole with the case, but he could have really offered some damning testimony to my father. Absolutely. No doubt about it. He, he did offer damaging testimony, but he had there was a lot more involved. They they had a real history over years, and it wasn't brought out. Just wasn't the questions weren't asked, the answers weren't given. Interesting. That is really interesting. <laughs> yes, it is. It really is. It was part of it was a high point or a low point, depending on how, which way you look at it. In the trial, this guy who knows a great deal is not being asked the questions, so he can't testify to what whatever it was that uh, he wanted to say. It's very interesting. You want to you put yourself in my position. This is very interesting. I'm sitting here, like uh, with you, I'm four feet away from this guy, wondering what in the devil is he doing up there, whistling and looking around the corner. And of course, I can't, I can't interject and say, hey, what, what do you want? To, what do you want to tell the court? You know, because that wasn't my yeah. place. <laughs> if I'd have been a trial to the court where I was the judge and jury, I might have done that. Like, said, why are you being so acting so silly on a witness stand? I couldn't do that in front of a jury because it's not no, my place no, to do no. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really, completely duped. Wow. I mean, it's you know. I, when you're dealing with a master manipulator and a narcissist and a sociopath, they can convince you of anything. I mean, my father, if you, you, I don't know if you've seen the film, A Murder in Mansfield, but when he comes in the room, he's in a very jovial state mm -hmm. because he thinks that I'm making a film to help him get out of prison. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can, I can feature that. <laughs> right. And I think that he when I say to him, ever since you murdered my mother, which is the first time I said it to him, uh -huh. he, his whole demeanor changes and all the air gets sucked out of the room. And it's like, oh, this just got real. And I think that he, you know, because he's such a narcissist, he just literally believed that that's what was happening. I mean, I know he believed that. I never led him, I never told him, no, dad, I'm going, I always said, you'll have an opportunity to tell your story. Mm -hmm. And, that's what I gave him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the, did he, he told, his testimony in court was that she left and got into a car. He never talked about her falling and hitting her head or anything, right? Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he, he told a whole story about her getting up, throwing credit cards at him, leaving the house and walking down the driveway. So for him to paint a whole different picture, 20 some, 25, 26, 27 years later, of what happened, it just shows the disconnect and the sociopathy and the just, it, 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 you're changing your story again. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I admire you for what you've done and what you're continuing to do. But does he understand that he'll never be granted parole until he admits his complicity? his guilt because they won't grant it I mean until he comes and they may not grant it then but they would have granted it before now if he had 
because he's done all the time he would have ever done if he's convicted of murder. <laughs> I sentenced him to 20 years of life and a year and a half for abuse of corpse. That's 21 and a half years. That's been gone now for nine years. Yeah. And and I watched that film. I watched it very closely. He just can't do it. He, he just cannot accept that I, John Boyle, would do such a thing as that. No, no way, no, no, absolutely not. And of course, we know the difference. Well, he, I, I think he believes it. I'm sorry? I think that he believes it. I think that he believes he didn't do it. Oh, I think he oh, believes oh. his story. Well, he, he has to. He told the story. And you know, and I'm sure that you're the experience, you've come in contact with pathological liars. Sure. Once they've told a story, they may change that story, but whatever they change it to is true. And the first story was true then, but now it's different because I'm looking at it differently. And, and the pathological liar doesn't count what anybody else thinks. It's only what they think that yeah. is important. And I don't think he can live with himself if all of a sudden he says, damn, wish I hadn't gotten caught, but I sure as hell did it. You know, I, I don't think he can live with that. I don't know how he lives with himself, well, but. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, what I I'm mean... thinking about you, you are living and you're doing well. You're, you're getting on with life, making, and we all either do it or don't, make our own way. And the people who refuse to not get over, but feel or refuse to deal with the situation, they never get on. They never get over it. And they live lives of quiet desperation. Or they try to get even somehow or other. And then they are, they are as evil as the person they're castigating. Hmm. Wow. You've done that. You've talked twice before. You said, wow. <laughs> but that's exactly what the jury said. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, I, I appreciate everything, Judge Henson. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to Kristen, <laughs> who, who set <laughs> yes. this up. I, yes, I will thank her for that. She's a good girl. Good to talk to you. You take good care. Good to talk of to you too. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank and, you. And thank you to Bob Gleckner for hooking us up. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, I will see Bob probably uh, Tuesday morning and I'll say so. <laughs> you take care of yourself. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I think one of the things that really fascinates me about it really appeals to me about doing this podcast for you guys and for myself is that I get to discover and learn so much about my life, what happened when I was a child, the trial, the, the, the ancillary victims, people that I didn't have in a murder in Mansfield because certain people wouldn't participate, right? For legal reasons or personal reasons or whatever. I'm learning so much about my past and about these things that have always, these little questions that you have back in the back of your mind, right? Like you grow up in living in these circumstances, but you don't ever really have these answers. Like, look, my birth family, they don't have any correspondence with me for the most part. Uh, like I said, my mother's side of the family and my si father's side of the family pretty much abandoned me when I, uh, when this all went down, I was remanded to the foster care system, was orphaned and had to deal with all this myself. And that sucked, <laughs> but you know, uh, so when I get these little answers from people that aren't directly involved with my family, that are community members or the judge from the trial or talking to Dave Messmore or talking to friends and people that reach out to me just because of this podcast. Like uh, when I ran into Debbie Allen at Westbrook country club, a couple of weeks ago, when I was back home in Mansfield, she shares some info and Bob Gleckner and his wife who literally said, you should talk to James Henson, retired judge, James Henson their friends and that's how he's on the program and it's and it's these people that are all contributing to my sort of personal journey and my sort of personal journey of discovery 
and discovering who I am, where I come from, what happened, because I was a kid. It's, I know it's probably hard to believe it's hard for me to believe, but it happened like almost 30 years, like 30 years ago, all this happened and I'm still learning so much. It's like I scratch the surface and it just all unfolds. It's like a black hole or a web or a bottomless pit of just information. And, you know, and I, as I open up my father's letters that I read to you guys, I just, just discover more and more stuff that I did not know existed. So it's really cool. And I'm glad you guys are here and a part of this journey. It's, it's really awesome to have you guys here. It's really awesome to do this program. Uh, you guys follow me on all the socials at call your Landry, TikTok at call your Landry. You guys are discovering more of my story with me. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all of that. And uh, yeah, this was a great episode. I'm Collier Your Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today.